So, um, huge topic, awful lot to talk about. Um, and, you know, Fabian uh, has been talking about uh, how um, women are prevented or don't find the ways to really shine in the workplace. And part of this is to do with um, the fact that we haven't really uh, understood how women's physiology impacts us. And, you know, uh, we're, we're still living under the weight of centuries of the patriarchal model, obviously. And so within that model, especially when it was at its height, and this is still reverberating on us today, everything that was male was seen as being the right way. You know, that, that, that a male experience of being in the body was privileged and a women's experience was correspondingly diminished. And so anything that only women do is, is seen in the most negative light possible most of the time. And so this has a huge effect on how we experience menstruation and menopause. So let's start off here with a girl is born. Now, even 30 or 40 years ago, there might have been someone going, oh, it's not a boy. Luckily, we've moved a long way beyond that. And you, I very rarely hear anyone say that they're sorry they had a daughter, unless they've already got five. Um, so a girl is born, and she grows up. And at some point, when she's somewhere between 10 and 14 years old, she gets her first period. Now, interestingly, the age of first period is dropping very dramatically. You probably know this, which is a whole huge interesting topic um, really uh, uh, p her, her first period comes when she's gained enough weight and her skeleton is strong enough to support being pregnant that's the <coughs> moment at which her, her period starts now in most um, Western developed countries there's minimal celebration around the period starting it's usually seen purely in biological terms. Um, there, there is a growing movement, you've probably maybe heard of this, of, of um, uh, some kind of celebration of the first period, but this is very much on the fringe. Indigenous cultures, as you may know, uh, the more female-friendly ones, especially those with a matrilineal structure, made a big deal of the first period. Um, my one of my favourites is the Navajo tradition, which they still do today. Um, I spent some time with women of the Navajo Nation and they have the most wonderful ceremony. It's called the Kinalda and it lasts for four days and the whole extended family come together. Um, and it's the major ceremony in their whole year because to them, a girl having her first period ensures the survival of the tribe. And it is you know, completely celebrated on all levels. She has to do physical feats of endurance because a woman being physically strong is important, which is something we've been realizing over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, there are all sorts of things that take place. I haven't got time to go into it today, but in all the cultures I looked at when I was doing research on this, the ones that celebrate the period um, either have a distinctly matrilineal tradition uh, structure in that you inherit through the female line women own land <coughs> um, uh, or in some way they're a very female friendly and also earth positive society those two things go together so this is very important in terms of the discussion that we're having here about ethics and climate change and looking after the planet that there's a relationship in indigenous cultures between <coughs> looking after the planet seeing nature as um, a benign force that you work with and you look after and you're a steward of your environment and being having positive uh, female friendly structures in the society and having positive celebration of the first period which is the proper name for which is menarche you may have heard of it's a Greek Greek word so that's the first period so at this point, a girl enters a uh, prolonged cyclical phase. So unlike men, who um, they, men have cycles too, but they're, it's much more steady. Their energy output 
um, their appetite, their emotional state is much more steady through the month. Um, but a woman, <coughs> from this point on until menopause, is a human being with a cyclical reality. Now, the extent of the cycle varies enormously from woman to woman. There's no one way. Um, some women are you know, don't experience very much fluctuation. Some women, it's a lot. So some women have a lot more energy when they're ovulating and a lot less when they're menstruating. Statistics show that it's um, very, very common for women <coughs> to be more extroverted at ovulation and more introverted um, when they have their period. A woman at ovulation is more articulate verbally than anybody, man, woman, child, any other time. So this is fascinating, I think, that um, we, we have this extra power of verbal delivery when we're ovulating. And it's not known exactly why, but it's, it's most likely that women use words to seduce. You know, women have um, greater verbal articulation anyway than men. And of course, it's one of the things that can cause problems in relationships when the man feels overwhelmed by the woman's ability to articulate what she's feeling. But at ovulation, this is particularly pronounced. Um, and, and in most, um, well, all over the world, you can find um, traditions where people went into some kind of a retreat at the new moon, which is obvious. If you're living before electric light, you can't do very much when the moon's new. Once the sun goes down, there's no light. Um, and it, but it was also known by ancient people that you have less energy at the new moon and more at the full moon. So the full moon is a time for a party. There's light at night. You can go out hunting. Um, and there's just more energy available. At the new moon, you retreat. Women have their period at the new moon. Um, they ovulate at the full moon. Now, since electric light, we've all been knocked off that rhythm. But that's actually the origin, we think, of this um, menstrual synchrony, which you've probably heard of, where um, girls and women who are together, say, on a vacation or at boarding school or something, have their period at the same time. And we think that that's because for, you know, thousands of years, women were all menstruating together at the new moon. Um, there's all sorts of um, stories about this. You know, Native American women, if they were having trouble getting pregnant, would sleep outside under the full moon for three nights in order to stimulate ovulation. Um, it was, you know, it's well known cross-culturally all over the world that there's a correlation between a woman's body and how it behaves and the lunar cycle as we know, that a period is the length of, um, the menstrual cycle is the same length as the lunar cycle. So we enter this time where we're cyclical. And if we can look at menstruation objectively and sort of filter out the conditioning we've had about it, then we can learn to live with that cycle in such a way that it benefits our health. So we can plan that we do more around the time of ovulation, because we've got more energy at our disposal. So that might would be a good time to throw a party or um, decide to work extra hard on a project. But at the new moon, we've got a bit less energy. So that's a time not to try and do too much. And what I've found in my own experience and the many women I've worked with, that when women start to consciously adjust to this cycle, it makes a massive difference in their health and therefore in their productivity. And that one of the big problems we have at the moment is that we're suppressing this natural cycle, trying to pretend it's not happening. That's what we're conditioned to do, right? Is we're supposed to carry on as normal all the time, be exactly the same through the month. But it's just not reality. That's not actually our experience. So it diminishes our ability to really be authentic and fully be in our experience and to feel strong and not to be apologizing for who we are and apologizing for the fact that we've got our period or we're feeling premenstrual or oh dear, you know. <coughs> um, once we start to really claim the cycle, then we become much stronger. Um, so, and then of course there's, uh, during this period of a woman's life, she may have, you know, a couple of pregnancies and that's a whole other huge 
issue in terms of a woman actually being able to follow her body and listen to its wisdom, but still be an effective member of society. Um, and then after you know, a certain amount of time, how many years, 30 years or whatever, quickly whiz through, then menopause happens. And the issue with menopause that doesn't get talked about nearly enough is that it's one of the very few experiences, well, it's the only actual experience that everybody pretty much goes through, every woman, that is a retrospective diagnosis. The, the diagnosis of menopause is that you haven't had a period for 12 months. So no woman knows that she's had her last period. You have your last period, you've got no idea, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you just don't know. And so what happens is, when I'm working with women who are menopausal and I ask them, you know, are you in menopause? Have you had menopause? They'll say, well, maybe. I haven't had a period for four months. I thought maybe I had a little bit of spotting the other day, but it seems to have gone away. So I don't know. This is a huge thing to go through because by the time this happens, you've, you've got used to this cyclical rhythm of your life. And actually, women think about it a lot, even if they're not thinking about it positively or constructively. You're always thinking, oh, we're going on vacation that weekend. Am I going to have my period then? Or um, what clothes shall I wear today? Oh, I'm feeling a bit fat. <coughs> you know, it, oh, I want to eat you know, loads of chocolate. I must be coming up to my period. It, it's a conversation that a woman is having with herself. And then everything starts to go kind of haywire around here. And you just don't know whether you're going to get another period or not. Um, you might look at the pads or tampons in the cupboard and go, am I ever going to need these again? I just don't know. So you're in this huge don't know for a year. And this is actually one of the most psychologically destabilizing aspects of menopause. Um, there's, a, you know, now you can have hormone tests and they tell a bit, but they're not at all foolproof. So this is something that merits a much bigger discussion than we've got time for today, but I just want to uh, you know, put it out there as something to think about and to consider as a factor in why menopause is disturbing. It's also compounded by the fact that in Western society, pretty much all the information we get about menopause is negative. <coughs> it's seen in the, in, in purely in terms of loss, that we are losing these the, the, the levels of hormones that would allow us to menstruate. And we, have to, we go through this strange thing where this menstruation thing that we've also been taught to be somewhat ashamed of or to minimise and not to talk about, now that we're losing it, suddenly it becomes this precious thing that, <coughs> right, that we really want to keep. Um, so that's all rather befuddling. And so menopause is this, seen as this cessation of something which is very different in Asian cultures. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, Asian women have much easier menopause than Western women do. They have far fewer symptoms. And there are various theories about why this might be, whether it's to do with their diet. Um, but one, what's ha happening now is that we're watching Asian women who are living in a Western context and they're starting to get the same symptoms. So it seems to be partly related to adrenal fatigue from being too stressed out in the years leading up to menopause and during it. But it also is related to the psychological aspect of how you feel about menopause. And menopause is disturbing enough because it's such a big adaptation for the body to go through. You know, it's this same adaptation <coughs> as you had at puberty, but actually magnified um, for various reasons. You're older, you've got more on your plate, you've got a lot of responsibility, and it's a big adjustment for the body to go through. But if you are going through that adjustment and feeling bad about what's happening to you, then this is a recipe for depression. And that then starts to affect the body adversely as well. So the difference between Western and Asian societies is that um, there's, there's a way of seeing menopause in a positive light in many Asian cultures. For example, the term for uh, menopause in China translates as second spring. And in Chinese medicine, menopause is seen as actually protective for the body and as a natural stage that a woman goes through so that she can live into a healthy old age. 
and it's considered that the energy that went towards making the menstrual blood instead moves up from the uterus to the heart and allows for the development of much more compassion and wisdom. So postmenopausal women are highly prized in a society that has made a picture like that. Um, in uh, India, same thing in Ayurvedic medicine, um, it's seen that menopause is actually a very wise thing that the body does so that you can have a healthy old age. Um, the um, several Native American tribes said that uh, after menopause a woman keeps the blood within her and they call, actually called it the wise blood because they also so thought that the menstruating woman herself was wiser than the rest of the month. And so you keep the wise blood within you and your wisdom just grows and grows. And so on their councils, they all, the postmenopausal women would sit on their councils and they would often have the last word. You know, if there was a decision being made about shall we go to war, the grandmothers would be the ones who <coughs> would say yes or no at the end of it. Um, how are we doing for time? Five minutes or something? So this phase after in those societies this phase here after menopause is seen in a positive light there's a lot to look forward to and the woman herself is becoming more valued not less and one of the main reasons that of course we're less valued in this society is because actually of capitalism and that's really what has fueled the youth-centered culture because young people buy a lot of stuff um, young people are more vulnerable to fashion and fads and uh, they're a, a great market. So we've come to venerate youth at the expense of age and that's having a massive effect on our social policy. Um, it's, it's really what fuels these short-term decisions that Fabian was mentioning. And so we, we desperately need to be able to harness the wisdom of postmenopausal women. Um, I don't know if y you know much about orcas, killer whales, but they're very interesting. They have a, a rather parallel life structure to human beings. Orcas are one of the very few species that go through menopause. Um, there's one sort of pilot whale as well that goes through menopause, but the only other animals, that, mammals that go through menopause are in captivity, but in the wild they don't. But orcas do, and they go through menopause at about the same age that human beings do. They start to, they, they become fertile around the age of 15 and then they go through menopause between the ages of 40 and 50. They have one child about every four to five years, which is what hunter-gatherer women did or do. Um, and so there's some very interesting parallels. They have the most stable social structure of any um, mammalian unit, much more stable than human beings. Elephants are pretty good as well, but orcas are excellent. Um, they have very little, um, uh, they, very little falling out within the family pod. Um, they often travel four generations together and the grandmothers are in charge. And they live, their lifespan like ours is similar, they live till about 80. So the grandmothers uh, they go through menopause between 40 and 50 and then have 30 to 35 years where they're in charge. And what they've created is this fantastically stable social structure. So that's something to think about. And to imagine, let's let ourselves imagine what would the world be like if smart, wise, self-confident, experienced, talented women were making major decisions. And compassionate. And compassionate, thank you. <coughs> yes, because the heart opening is a big part of a conscious <coughs> menopause. One of the problems that happens today is often women are medicated out of having a conscious menopause. This is a huge problem because this is a temporary phase. Yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is disturbing. You know, hot flashes and not being able to sleep and body aches. It's not, you know, a lot of fun for a while, but it passes. It's something you need to go through. And taking, um, for most women, taking hormone replacement therapy just holds it off. Uh, you know, it just stops something from happening. And that what's happening is a natural adaptation process. And if you let it happen and get through to the other side, then it's a wonderful phase of life. And again, as you did in this phase, you have a steady energy flow. So you're actually more able to predict what you're going to be capable of doing. 
Um, and it's, it can be a very, very grounded and very powerful and empowered time for a woman, and the world needs that. Most people in the room would love to hear it. Just give us, you know, five or ten minutes of your insights about what happens in that period of life where we're having children. Did you feel comfortable <coughs> giving us a few headlines? Because we kind of skipped that. I know it's not We hard. did. Would we you did. like to just yeah. give us some headlines about what you've said, what you've observed, what you. Well, you know, I think you mentioned, you know, quite a few of the the issues that come up. Obviously, we have made this separation of family life and work life, which is damaging, I think, to everybody. Uh, it's, you know, industrialization has had an enormous impact on the way that we relate to childbirth. Of course, the plus side of it is that the technology means that infant mortality is much, much less than it was, and also maternal mortality. So we have a lot to be grateful for from, um, you know, the, the technology and, and the developments in that way. And I don't mean to say that we should all be living like hunter-gatherers in a tribal way, no, that, that would be ridiculous. We're extremely talented and creative species and uh, that should be celebrated, but not at the expense of mothers and families. Um, but it's a question also of how we, how we manage that. To go back to the Chinese model, they have this um, idea that after giving birth, there is something they call the golden month. And that the first month after giving birth to a baby is a time for a woman to be really, really bond with that baby and just to be with the baby all the time. The grandmother or whoever would take care of the other children. You wouldn't <coughs> be expected to work at all. You just stay with the baby. And of course, that's a time when your oxytocin levels are at their highest, the bonding hormone. And what they find is that if a woman really bonds completely and absolutely with her baby for that month, then that bond is set. You don't have to worry about it after that. Women in China go back to work pretty early, you know, after one or two months. Um, but there's not an issue of them feeling, you know, terribly torn from the child because the bond is a psychic bond as well as a, a physical one, and they've really made it. So there's something about the way that we're not really diving into all of our female experiences, whether it's taking some time out to yourself when you have your period, um, having that golden month with your newborn, or taking a sabbatical when you're in menopause. You know, we, we, we have a different life structure um, than men that means that we need to be thinking more out of the <coughs> box about how we actually handle that. 